Viva uh, European headquarters for this uh, nice photography travelogue or uh, how to put it, better put it, maybe seeing the world through the eyes of, of Anton. Um, this is part of our kind of a little bit more relaxed format and a little bit more kind of, you know, a coffee break format, if you will, uh, to, to tell a little bit more about the, the device itself. And, and also, as you might have seen, we, we had some terrific photos that Anton took as part of our promo shots for the X60 Pro. Uh, and then, then better who to, to tell about the, the, the experience first hand than, than Anton himself. And he's he will do a, a introduction, of course, but uh, maybe just a quick kick off that. Uh, we're, we're delighted to have him here. He's a professional landscape and travel photographer based in Moscow in Russia. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit jealous of the fact that he has a chance to spend over 250 days a year traveling and seeing the world. Um, and and uh, yeah, especially I think these these harsh winter conditions. I think that's that's something that probably my dogs and myself would love. So I'll, I'm just putting down next time you you, you plan a trip, Anton. I'm definitely coming with. Uh, yeah. So as, as mentioned, um, we will have a dedicated Q and A session at the end. But if there's something in particular that you know comes to mind in in the meantime, please feel free to. Uh, drop us a message in the chat and and if you agree also we would hit record on the session um so uh, we can we can also share maybe with some colleagues who um, had some last minute cancellations um before yeah so before diving into the topic then over to you anton and and uh, the floor is yours thank you ivan thank you everyone for coming and uh, i think i'll start the screen share and we'll start the lecture itself. And uh, oh, just a little bit of a. Uh, uh -huh. Do you see the image? One second. <coughs> There, it should do the trick. Uh, so, if you don't mind, can I have a little bit of the feedback? Do you have visuals? Yes, and we're hearing you loud and clear. Yeah. And you should see the first slide, like my about photography and this uh, island and everything. Yep. Is that right? Yes. yes. Yeah. Amazing. So, we'll start. Uh, so, as Ivan already told, uh, I'm a travel photographer based in Moscow. My name is Anton, Anton Agarkov, and I really spend most of the year traveling and doing photography workshops. And uh, it covers mostly Russia and Central Asia. And especially now with the borders closed, I'm really happy to, to be living in the country that is so huge to explore. So. Today I will show you some uh, pictures from some distant places and we'll give you a little bit of uh, advices, maybe tips and tricks to make your photography just a little bit better. Uh, and I hope you will find them handy. So, okay, normally uh, you would see me like this, carrying a huge tripod, a big uh, photography bag with that's up to 15 kilos of gear. Uh, but this here, I somehow rethought my approach to photography, not completely, but anyways. Uh, I started working with Vivo, and I understood that uh, there are things that you can uh, delegate to your mobile photography. And uh, normally people would say that uh, the phone is... Uh, in comparison to the ordinary camera, it has a, a gap and uh, it can't do everything. But still, many people forget that uh, the photography is not about, really is not about the gear. The tool, the tool of uh, capturing what you see and what, what you feel at the moment that most people forget. And um, good sunset, like good colors, is only good colors, nothing more. 
uh, like nice rock is only nice rock and uh, like even this amazing uh, arch on the distant island is nothing more than a huge piece of rock and there should be something more behind the picture to make it great and that's not the gear that you're using actually and uh, the good picture like a good movie or a good book is always about the idea of uh, what you want to picture when you look at something really amazing try to make a just tiny stop and say who why do i want to pull the trigger to push a button of my camera at this moment why do i want to capture this and try to just dive into your feelings and understand and try to like ask yourself a question why it's so fascinating that i want to make a picture of this and after that you would get a okay you will try to understand you will try to say okay now i like this rock on the background it stands so lone in the sea that is like waves around and you start to compose your image inside your mind and you start to understand that this is the image about this opposition of mountains and water. You don't really need like an artistic approach. And then you come to the next idea that the moment, as Henri Cartier-Bresson told, the important moment, the decisive moment, and uh, sometimes a big camera is uh, something that you can't pull out at the very important decisive moment. You just lose everything. I will tell you a story about how I met a fox on the Kuril Islands. There are lots of those Kuril Islands in those uh, lectures. And um, I just walk, was walking the um, uninhabited island and I was thinking, oh, the foxes are the major carnivores and I just really love foxes, love taking pictures of those. And I was carrying my camera set up with a wide angle lens and even listening to music. And then suddenly something just bursted underneath my feet and I understood that I was so much in my uh, thoughts that uh, I almost stepped on a fox and it just ran, ran, ran away into the bushes. And I started talking with it and I said, oh, oh, fox, my, you're my friend. Oh, sorry, I just stepped on you, sorry. And I was just uh, changing my wide angle lens on the camera to the telephoto lens and I almost made a shot and then boom, battery is dead. And while I was changing the battery, the fox, of course, it ran away. Uh, but I still remember this moment while we were playing hide and seek in those bushes and it was looking at me and I just remember this frame. So I think that decisive moment, I, I just lost this moment and lost actually amazing frame that I could make. And this leads us to an idea that you should always be ready. And the best moment is to have the camera that is always ready to shoot. And uh, in this case, the phone might be really good. And in these conditions, I even disembarked on this island without my ordinary camera, but only with a, with a Vivo X60 phone to capture these uh, images. It's not always I'm doing like this, but at this, at this time, this image was only captured on a Vivo. So uh, to depict your ideas and to, to catch this decisive moment, you really need to be, first of all, really, really need to be ready. You really need to have a camera at hand. And you also need to understand why you want to shoot this. Um, but how would you try to speak with your audience uh, through your image? And I developed through the years, developed the idea of so-called visual keys. And the idea is that um, normally when we write something, we use words of language and we make um, sentences from words. But it's easy because words denote a single meaning or like a several meaning, but they are clear. But how can we denote something by the image? And thus I came to the idea of so-called visual keys. And there are lots of them, like lots, like 
as many as words. Uh, but I would uh, would focus on a several of them, and one of them is the foreground. The foreground is pretty uh, amazing thing because here you would have these huge rocks on the foreground and they would just pull your audience attention and they would just give you the feeling of this um, of being there um, they get immersed in the scene they just stand there they see and and what that is they just feel and they look at the distance and this huge foreground gives them the feeling of being there but at the same time, the background, which is also very distinctive, and uh, this is the main character. This is also important to speak with your audience, telling, like in a good movie, there is always a main character. And you, you should try to understand what is, who is the main character of your image. For me, this is this distant island that is covered in a fog, and you're looking at it from the distance. The main character might be like this, like a... a rock on the background normally the main characters are on the background and the foreground is so-called the place of action uh, or it can be like a huge volcano also you see that the volcano on the dis in the distance uh, and there it shows like this big amazing thing but where it is it's it's somewhere in like this flat desert but there's still grass so there's some things you can think about and it give your audience the, um, something to think about while looking at the picture. Uh, of course, your main character might be a man-made object like this uh, lighthouse and or even uh, a transport like this boat and we uh, just set this boat and um, we show it in the environment. But also, of course, a person can be your main character, and the person in, in, in the landscape is um, about two main goals. First of all, the feeling of scale. Is this place big or small? Uh, without uh, this little person out there, we cannot tell, is it, is it big, is it small? By the way, this island is called the Yankee Island, uh, and uh, my um, addiction to Kurils started from this place because it's so-called the pole of unreachability. Uh, it's furthest from all the settlements in this area, about uh, 430 kilometers away from the nearest settlement. And uh, it's pretty much amazing, a tiny island, but so dense with amazing structures and forms, and to show that the, the how big they are or how small they are we need a person but at the same time also the emotional connection of your audience that if there is a person there psychologically there is a feeling of your audience that i can also be there and uh, maybe i can also go there which is pretty much amazing um this connection because it like gives your audience some kind of a trust in your images it's not like a photographer is an uh, extraterrestrial being, he just flew to somewhere other planet, showing us this from the other world. No, that, that's, that's actually happening here in the same world as where we are. And of course, this works in ama amazingly well in, uh, in the caves, because the caves, uh, even if with, the, with this island, we still have some feeling of scale. In the caves, we don't have. And putting a person in a cave shot will give you really good results, and I recommend to do that. Um, but what if... Okay, a person is a good idea to put in the picture, but also that's a good idea to put a, an animal. And uh, sometimes the animals giving your viewers this understanding of what's wildlife out there, who lives there, we are guests and they are the actual inhabitants of this place. Um, but sometimes this kind of comparison of living being and some metallic, huge metallic object, inanimate object, can give you a hilarious comparisons, which are nice, like this, the tiny dog in a huge airplane, or 
this one, the dog that's fooling around in the old ruins. And this was another visual key, the person or a main character in your, uh, in your uh, image. But what about the composition? Many people say that composition is the main part of the, any single landscape. Well, yes and no. It's the other visual key, and composition would allow you to make your image harmonic and more easily tell the story. And uh, this is also very important to tell that uh, composition is not something that we just thought up. It's based on how we think and um, the rules of composition. They are not because somebody sat down and wrote a huge book about this is right and this is wrong. No, that's, it's, it's not working like this. It's based on how we think. And more or less every single person in the world, most people in the world, they find more or less the same things being harmonic. So what about the composition? Uh, many people say that the major rule of composition is a rule of thirds. Actually, that's not right. And the rule of thirds is, it might be surprising to many of you, that the rule of thirds is not actually the rule, but some artificial man-made monster, and I even have a huge lecture on rule of thirds, like 40 minutes, I describe why it's not right not to use it. But the major thing is the rule of balance. Here uh, you will see that the person out there, a person in a red jacket, who is of course our main character, because if there is a man, he instantly becomes the main character for our audience, because we can associate, associate uh, ourselves with this person. And he is in the lower right corner, and the upper right left corner is a tower. And you see, they are in the same diagonal, but in a, like more or less opposite, opposing corners. And for this image, the person out there is our main character, and the tower is its um, counterpart. And most of the image looking good, they have a main character and counterpart, something that balances the image. The next one is leading lines. Leading lines, pretty pretty easy. You see that here we also have a main character, which is actually me, and those swirling lines on the foreground, they're leading to me. The audience attention just pulling into the, into the depth of the shot. And here we also see this uh, horseman out there in the distance and those leading, leading lines of the waves, they are pulling our attention to the horseman. By the way, there is yet another rule working here, the rule of contrast. Our horseman is dark on the uh, more or less bright foreground uh, and you can use that. Uh, Japanese artists were professionals in that uh, making minimalistic, show, uh, minimalistic drawings and you can learn from them. Uh, but also leading lines cannot be actually a lines, but a series of uh, dots, like here, the seashells, they form the leading line towards this aircraft in the distance. Also, we have the resemblance of shapes. You see how the uh, slopes forming the shape of the volcano, but mirrored. Try to look for this kind of uh, mirroring, resembling shapes and using them in your images. Framing is also a very uh, good way to isolate the object. Here the main character in the distance is this amazing mountain. And the framing are those two gravestones, ancient, they're, they're really old, like 16th century uh, gravestones, maybe all, even older. And uh, our attention is not is, is pulled inside, like in, into the funnel. But here the framing is opened, and it's not closed on the above. We can also use the natural framing like this to frame the main character out there in the background. And here is another example of natural framing. Or this. And um, of course for uh, Many for, for a long time, the major comparison between uh, handheld cameras and uh, phone cameras were like, all oh, the phone cameras, they have only uh, one prime lens 
and not more than that. We have to work with one prime lens. That's that's it. But nowadays, well, not anymore. We have three, four lenses now, and uh, I really love that because it gives the versatility. Uh, and okay, you can make the like this image like this uh, and showing the. Uh, the landscape with the foreground, with the background, with this island in the distance. But at the same time, you can make a telephoto lens and just pick a bit or just, just a tiny bit of the image uh, and uh, show this to your audience because it's interesting, really. People are seeing the world through your pictures and they are interested, asking, what's in there? What's in there? And you give them this feeling and uh, this this idea of showing the details okay but at the same time this is the telephone lens but my favorite just my favorite is the wide angle i love this immersing images with huge heavy foreground like this image on the uh by the way that's more or less the same moment and the same place where i step on a fox and here we see the those uh, rotted entrance uh, on the shore of a circular lake. Just imagine, there is an island, and southern part of the island was a huge volcano, Taurusu. And many, many years ago, like thousands of years ago, it uh, it was demolished by a huge eruption, forming a huge crater. And from this crater, a new volcano started emerging. So if we look from the above, you will see that there is a huge ocean, there is an island, there is a lake on this island, and in the middle of this lake, well, not in the middle actually, but in this lake, there is another island. And guess what? If you fly on a helicopter on top of this volcano, which is pretty high, it's like 1,356 meters, pretty high one, you will see another tiny lake. It's like, uh, you know, Russian Matryoshka doll. Um, well, anyway, the wide angle, just love those shots. And I'm really happy that uh, X60 Pro has this wide angle lens that would allow you to make shots like this. And if you need to go even wider, you can use a built-in panorama tool. I love panorama t panoramic shots because they... Well, more or less, our sight is panoramic. We see the world like not, it's not square, it's not vertical, we see panoramic. And this panorama that stitches automatically just give us this, um, the same feeling as, as we see the world. And some images, some situations, they're, they're not good, good even for a wide shot. We need another aspect ratio of the picture, we need it to be wider, we need it to be longer, like here. By the way, you see, there is, I, I just love this shot. By the way, this, this shot is uh, from X70 Pro, uh, the others were from X60. I, lo I just love it, because you see here is the main character, the opposition to a huge mountain, a small man and a huge mountain on top of him. The silhouettes, the isolation, the contrast, everything just met up. And this panoramic tool that allows you to capture the whole mountain and give it a breathing room on the left and on the right and on the top. Just, wow, just just love this shot. And I decided to include this in the lecture because it may be the best example of panoramic shots, how, how they should be and why they are great. And also, I just love the, fit, uh, the, uh, the feature of... Uh, um, extreme night shot. There is there is a function of the extreme night shots in the Evivo X60 Pro and in a new X70 Pro. And using this feature, you can make a panoramic shot. And here, uh, it was totally worth it because uh, this shot tends to be more panoramic. Okay, but looking wider, don't forget to look closer. You can make a wide angle shot like this, but don't forget to use your telephoto lens and just try to look through the... to, to, to shoot a close-ups of this kind of images. 
I love those shots. And if anybody want, um, and uh, if you are thinking about uh, some decoration for the interior, the interior images are not classical landscapes normally, but more of this kind of uh, abstracts. Uh, and for example, this one, this this image, and. Now we take this telephoto lens and boom, here we are taking this abstract. Amazing, I just love that. This, this image is one of my favorites uh, for, throughout the year, one of my favorites close-ups. And of course you can not only use the telephoto lens for close-up close uh, shots, for minimalistic shots. This one was made uh, with a normal lens. And uh, there is yet another thing that I want to tell you, just giving you a nice tip that uh, normally when you shoot something, some, um, some close-ups, try to get rid of as many details as possible, because the more details, the more chaotic your image is, and our close-ups, they tend to be more like minimalistic, uh, calmer type of images. And uh, this image I shot in the Caucasus Mountains, I decided to get rid of the excess details in the water, because you know that during the daytime, if you shoot water, it's all like in, in these tiny bubbles, freckles, everything. And you can use the built-in uh, slow shutter feature that makes series of shots and then just sums it up to make this slow water feature and eliminate the excess uh, details on the moving water. Now, uh, another, another example of a close-up, which I really love. And, uh, of course, using the minimalistic uh, approach, you can not only go with, um, like, telephoto lens, but also with the wide angle. By the way, this image of the... Um, mm, I don't remember in English how this bush is called, but this is a curse for a traveler uh, because it's it can be like maybe a knee high or a waist high, but it's almost impossible to track uh, those bushes. Uh, they're all entangled. But this kind of shot uh, you can only make with a something small, like with a phone camera, because the smaller the sensor, uh, the bigger the field of depth. And with an ordinary camera, it would just have take edges to set up and arrange everything and make this uh, technique of uh, stacking shots and sum up, boom. But with a, with a phone, boom, one shot, you're done. Okay, now, another visual key is light. And light can make anything better. And I prefer to shoot against the light, I really love that. But uh, many people would say that the phones are not very good shooting against the light. Well, yes and no. Nowadays, uh, phones, and especially with Vivo X60 Pro, it's having the NHL algorithm, which are making a pretty good job uh, fixing the sun. But if you want to make the shoot against the light, you should help out your phone a little bit. like. If the, if the sun is covered by a thick layer of clouds or even the branch of the tree, uh, you would get, at the same time, the volume of uh, shots shot against the sun and at the same time, no uh, huge overexposed parts. The side light. Love it. It's, it's amazing. Uh, because it gives like this volume. It's easier to work for the phones. It's easier to work with the side light like here on this image. And of course this. You've already seen this tower in the previous shots with me. But many people would say that, okay, I would shoot during the daytime, uh, during the sunrise and sunset. Uh, yes and no at the same time. Sometimes the shots made during the daytime might also be good, especially winter shots like this one. Or this, the, the feeling of contrast of the blue waves and blue skies. It's just something in this shot and it's made in during the daytime. And sometimes you, there, there are places only reachable by the daytime, like this one. But there's yet another time, before the sunrise or after the sunset. 
Let's call it blue hour. The light is soft. The, the light of the sun that is going down. And it gives the phone this um, ability to exposure the image properly without overexposing, underexposing. But if you go a little bit even like earlier for the sunrise and later for the sunset, you will see this blue hour, just amazing. And the illumination of the town, the illumination, artificial illumination, and the bluish daylight, they give this nice feeling of contrast. And it's pretty interesting that uh, in uh, Vivo 60 Pro, it has the built-in artificial intelligence algorithm that understands if your camera is on a tripod or not, and adjust the settings. And if you use uh, the tripod, which I recommend for this kind of shots, um, it will um, get more crispier images. Or even like this one. This image was uh, done in the Ingushetia Mountains, and you cannot even see the first stars appearing on the sky. Or like this, the exposure of the tiny village on the top of the mountains. And if you go even darker, it's almost night. And weather. Many people would say that, oh, the weather is bad, I'm not shooting. No, no way. The, the fog is giving you this amazing feeling of, uh, of a, it just disconnects the foreground from the background, giving this feel, feeling of volume. And if you use a telephoto lens, you can uh, emphasize the thickness of the fog. Here are some pictures. And as sometimes, for some places, bad weather is better than good weather. In terms of the image, it's like this. This, this is really gloomy weather. And this, this is a normal weather for Kuril Islands, like this foggy, gloomy, dark, and at the same time, very emotional. Or like this, the shores, the shore, the waves, and this, uh, young volcano that's almost monochromatic image but it is like this out there it was not if you if you look closer you will see that little bit of the greens on the left and on the right on the top side of the frame but still it looks like almost monochromatic as well as this one but we were only speaking about the landscape photography out here but most of us were living in the cities or towns and what about the cityscapes and townscapes and uh i in this year i started to make lots of images in towns and i love this and i have several ideas that i want to share is that first of all uh explore because uh look for uh, look for major attractions in the city uh look for high viewpoints speak with the locals get lost at, at well it, it sounds funny and uh but for me the best the best thing about shooting in town is really to get lost and trying to look for uh, interesting bits and pieces not only for like this panoramic shots which also good and they were shot from the high viewpoint uh, or or something like this but i also tend to roam around the uh, twisting streets of old towns. That's that's why I love the old towns, oriental towns, like uh, towns of Uzbekistan, uh, like Bukhara and Hiva. Um, and I prefer to walk around out there, even at night, and to shoot like this um, bits and pieces of the streets, and sometimes even focus on uh, tiny details. On what's happening out there. By the way, this image in that shot in Derbent in uh, Russia, in Dagestan, uh, for me this is very important because this image was actually shot at night in the extreme night mode and the shutter speed was, was three seconds and it's sharp and it's amazing how the algorithms and uh, stabilization of the phone is working like 100% amazing and uh, with a camera, I would say I would have to set the uh, ISO to really high values to get this kind of shot. But when you explore the when you explore the towns, when you explore the distant countries somewhere that you 
you are a foreigner. Try to try not to stick only to the postcard images that are like I'm shooting this because it's in it's in the guidebook or something. Try to explore, try to communicate with people, try to know what they are, who they are, what they are doing, what kind of crafts, what, what animals do they have, what uh, arts do they have, what, what kind of food are they eating, and uh, try to capture those moments, because this kind of images, they sum up to amazing portrait of the place where you have been. Those close-ups, wide angles, people. And this is where the phone really comes to play. The phone is, as I said in the, in the beginning, the phone is your camera that is always with you. And that is always uh, ready to go. And there are snapshots that, uh, that just add up to this portrait. Okay, this, this like nice uh, post-processed landscapes, they are good, but the portrait of the country, the portrait of the place where you've been, it's summed up not only by those landscapes, but also by situations, by like tiny things, like it was really cold and those cows were covered in frost, and or we were shooting in the sunrise and then suddenly this dog approached us and it started to, to mess with our framing and we decided that, well, let's make it a part of the picture. And this constitutes the stories that you tell to people. And I think this is the place where uh, the phone actually kicks in. And that's, that's so amazing because I started with, with a phone that, that is with a reliable and high quality phone that can make high quality images. I started to make more pictures like this, uh, more, more of these snapshots. And uh, it is funny how... Um, well, one of my my major uh, thing that I do for a living is a workshops uh, and uh, photography tours. But I also do lots of uh, workshops like this, lectures. And I normally tend not to use uh, images uh, from the phone, taken on the phone in my lectures, but not anymore. I understand that, first of all, these are unique situations that I managed to capture on my phone because it was always with me, always ready. But at the same time, uh, the quality is so good that I can uh, take a picture and then show it to everybody on a huge screen and that would be okay. And uh, this, that's it. That's uh, how the phone allowed me to just to level up my not only my photography and just rethink how I work, how I shoot in the journeys, but also uh, add up a little bit to my lectures. And in the end of this lecture, I want to um, add a little bit of the extra, because all of those images, most of those images, like 99%, were made with um, X60 Pro, but Starting this image, there are several that are made with uh, X70 Pro phone, and I just want to show them uh, to you and uh, <laughs> uh, tell that I can't be more happy to use that uh, phone, and uh, just and uh, I just love it in my journeys, and uh, the quality of the pictures surprised me very much, and uh, it's even better. And uh, you can see it on, on the on the shot on the right the example of a uh, biotar imaging style and my favorite part of the new phone is uh, uh, another lens telephoto lens uh, x5 which is uh, equivalent to 125 millimeters it's not super telephoto but anyway that allows you to make shots like this really and i, I think you already understood that i love close-up shots and this new lens uh, I shot like <laughs> a huge bunch of shots uh, from the new phone were made on this super telephoto lens. So, thank you very much for listening. And I hope you knew something interesting for you and you can level up your photography the way I did.